right, YouTube. So now we are going to take a look at acid chloride reactivity, and this is part one. So there was a previous lecture to this lecture, which was the acid, basically the carboxylic acid derivatives. And we were looking at all of the different compounds that we could make from a carboxylic acid. And this included things like acid chlorides, anhydrides, uh, esters and amides. So if you haven't checked out that video, I would strongly encourage you to look at that lesson before continuing on here. And now we're going to take a look at acid chloride reactivity, and this is part one. We will definitely be breaking some of these derivatives up into two parts given the number of reactions that they can undergo. So as we get started here with acid chloride reactivity, remember an acid chloride is going to be the general formula an R group, C double bond O, and then we have a CL here. Now, I did just want to mention, sometimes students will ask about what, what about acid bromides or acid iodides, uh, because you could technically have other halogens there. And yes, that's true, you could have other halogens, but as you increase the size of the halogen, meaning you go from chlorine to bromine to iodine, the leaving group gets better and better. And it turns out that the halides are much more reactive as leaving groups when they're attached to carbonyls than when they're attached to just regular alkyl groups. And so while we may have, the, in theory, acid bromides and acid iodides, you tend not to see them as often simply because they're so excessively reactive that acid chlorides suits us well enough as far as any synthetic purposes and what we'd be looking to accomplish. Now, how do we create, because all of these come from a carboxylic acid, how do we create a carboxylic acid going into an acid chloride? So what we would do is we would start with a carboxylic acid. And when we have that carboxylic acid, the reagent that we're gonna use in order to accomplish this is SOCl2. And when we use SOCl2, we will turn the carboxylic acid into the acid chloride, a much more reactive derivative. That's why we call it a carboxylic acid derivative. Uh, notice that we still have the carbonyl. We have a partially negative type of compound here. So very similar. That's why we would call it a derivative. Now, how this actually works, when you take a look at the SOCl2, this would be the general structure for SOCl2. And it's the oxygen on the carboxylic acid that can come in and when it does, it will attack the sulfur, right? Now, as this occurs, we can form an intermediate here, and this intermediate would look something like this. So I still have the carboxyl group there, right? The oxygen, here's the hydrogen. This would now have a plus charge because it sent out some electrons to the sulfur. The sulfur would have this general form at the moment, and we have a chlorine and a chlorine here. Now one of the chlorines is going to leave because chlorine is a good leaving group and as that happens the set of electrons here can come back down. As this chlorine dissociates this or another base that you might have in solution uh, is going to come and pick up the hydrogen here. So I'm just going to represent this as base okay but a base of some sort is going to pick up that hydrogen in order to create the oxygen in its regular state without the formal charge. So what this leads to is you've got the original portionality of the carboxylic acid. Now this is attached to SOCl, and this is gonna turn out to be a decent leaving group because I can generate sulfur dioxide and another chlorine out of this. So what will happen is the chlorine right here that I just liberated is going to come back in as a decent nucleophile. So this chlorine here, okay, chlorine tends to be a weak base, but it's a good nucleophile. This chlorine here is going to come into the carbonyl here. That is going to force this carbonyl bond up because oxygen, I'm sorry, the carbon can only have four bonds, right? The oxygen will need to take that extra set of pi electrons in the meantime. And so what this is going to lead to all right, I'm going to give myself a little bit more space here. I'm going to scroll down. What this is going to end up leading to is I have R, C, O minus up here. Okay, and I've got the chlorine down here. So I've got this sort of tetrahedral intermediate and then the oxygen. Okay, now remember, I said that we can create sulfur dioxide and chlorine. This can very easily come apart into those two stable 
uh, molecules. So I should say chloride, okay, is going to leave. And then this oxygen will go ahead and give these electrons over to the sulfur. So this is going to be SO2 and Cl as the side products. And then as that's occurring, this would come back down. And so the final result here, okay, would be that I get the acid chloride and then I also have as side products SO2 and Cl minus. And there you go, you now have your acid chloride and you can utilize this for other reactions. So let's take a look at some of those other reactions, the ones that we can utilize given the acid chloride. So remember the acid chloride is the most reactive of all the carboxylic acid derivatives. So we're really going to see the largest number of potential reactions in the acid chloride series, then the anhydride, then the ester, and then by the time we get to the amide we're very limited in the number of reactions we can do because that general chart that we went over in the previous lecture shows the reactivity where it says you know, the acid chlorides at the top, then the anhydride, then the ester. And that's really based on the leaving group. Um, so I'm going to give an example here. One of the first things we can do is all of the derivatives have the ability to go back into carboxylic acids. So all I would need in order to do this is to run this in the presence of H2O. And you usually need a base of some sort, a very popular base to pick out. In this case is pyridine. You'll see many of these reactions being run in pyridine. It's affordable. It's a cheap, uh, decent base. Hydroxide is another popular um, choice for a lot of the derivative reactions. So what's going to happen here? the water is going to come in all right it's going to act as a nucleophile and when i do this i will end up with the again tetrahedral intermediate we're going to see this as a very common theme as i go along right so here we go and now i just got water to come in here remember it comes with the positive charge this is not oh yet so the chlorine is going to leave in this case, and when that happens, right, this would come back down. Now some people might show this occurring in the same step where the uh, proton removal is going to occur. I don't mind showing it in a separate step here. The chlorine's gone, so now I'm dealing with basically a protonated carboxylic acid. And in order to polish this off, the pyridine, the base, Okay, is going to come in and abstract the remaining proton. So we'll get rid of that, right? The electrons can go there, and then we arrive at the respective carboxylic acid. So this is really the opposite of what we just accomplished, right? We took a carboxylic acid, we turned it into an acid chloride. So now we're saying we can take an acid chloride and turn it back into a carboxylic acid without a problem. So one of the other types of reactions we can do is going down the list after the acid chloride we find the anhydride. So the anhydride can be created by taking another type of carboxylic acid and utilizing it as the general nucleophile. So I have the acid chloride here. What I would need in this case, and again I'm going to be looking for some sort of base here that goes along with this, and we'll talk about why here in a second. I would create a reaction with another equivalence of some carboxylic acid. These can be the same. Um, sometimes it turns out that it's better if they're the same exact compound. However, when you're working with this, um, you will end up with an anhydride. So what's going to occur here is that the carboxylic acid in the presence of the base okay, is going to be deprotonated. And so what I'm going to create here is a resonance stabilized base, right? Conjugate. So with this, I can then send this group in in order to displace the chlorine. So, right, I get the regular attack. I now have R, C, double bond, O. I'm going to have an O and that attacked a C. This O is O minus at the moment that had the chlorine on it, right? There's another R here, and this is a Cl. So take a look here. 
I'll change the colors just so people follow along. All right, this portionality right here came from the acid chloride and then that's in the red. The one in the blue came from the carboxylic acid. So we're really fusing these two parts together in the reaction that I just showed you here. So once we are set with that, all right, let me switch back to my black ink. Once we get to this intermediate, we can get the chlorine to leave, we can get the group right here, this O minus to come back down, and we end up with the anhydride. So remember an anhydride has two carbonyl groups with an oxygen in between them. And this would be second on the reactivity list. So acid chlorides can create anhydrides because they're less reactive, but anhydrides are not going to be able to directly create acid chlorides. As you move down the list, you have to go back up to a carboxylic acid in order to create any of these other additional ones. All right, so now that we've taken a look at that one, I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at the ester formation. We can keep our general acid chloride there. All right, so now if I would like to form an ester, I need some sort of an alcohol of choice and then I will again use a base. So notice most of these are going to require a base of some sort. So I'm sort of switching back and forth between pyridine and hydroxide which are two common examples. So in this case I'm going to have the alcohol come in and attack the carbonyl. Right? We're going to do our normal tetrahedral intermediate. I get O minus and then I would have H, R, right? And that would be a positive oxygen right there. And then I have the Cl here. So in the usual fashion, the Cl is removed, right? This can come back down. And when I do this, right, I've got the O and I've got R, H here. So at this point, I can now use the pyridine to come in and take the hydrogen away from what was originally the alcohol, and this will create the ester functionality that I need. So moving up here, I now have OR, okay? And then the last one we're gonna take a look at in this lecture is how we can use acid chlorides to create amides. And then there's a whole nother set of reactions we're gonna take a look at in the next lecture, which will be part two. So we will bring up one more time our acid chloride here. Now the acid chloride this time is going to be exposed to some sort of an amine group in order to create the amide. So. Sometimes, I'll just put a note over here, sometimes this reaction is run with two equivalents of amine. All right? Now I'm showing NH3, just general ammonia in this example. There's no reason that this can't be you know, NH2, CH3, that's a perfectly fine amine. There's no reason this couldn't be double, so two CH3s and then just NH. All, right, all of those would be perfectly acceptable examples when you're working with amines. It doesn't just mean ammonia, even though that's the one I'm gonna be showing in this example. So I want people to keep that in mind, that you can certainly use primary and secondary amines when you're getting ready to start attempting to do this, okay? Now, a lot of times two equivalents is used because amines will act as decent bases. So one equivalent of this is going to be used for the actual reaction, the addition. And then the other equivalence is going to be used as the base in order to remove the unneeded hydrogen. Now, sometimes you will find that instructors only give you one equivalence and then there's another base present. And that is also true in the lab. If you have an amine that you're going to add that is very expensive and costly, you're not gonna double up with a second one as a base because that's a very expensive technique in order to, let's say I have an amine, right? And the amine is $100 per gram. It would be very wasteful for me to turn around and take that precious amount of amine that I have, the one gram, and say, oh, I'll just add double the amount than what I really need because I, it, some of it needs to act as a base. No, you get you know pyridine or sodium hydroxide or something cheaper at that point. So I just wanna point that out, that this can be run with one equivalence of amine 
and then an equivalence of a cheaper base. All right, so we're gonna do it with two equivalents of a mean. So we're gonna say that we have two NH3, and that should be all that we need here. So the nitrogen, I'm gonna take one of them, and this should be getting very repetitive by now. You should have a, a good understanding of how this is working, right? So tetrahedral intermediate, I'm gonna have the N H3, remember to never toss out protons until you've shown what's happened to them. This is a carbocation here. I'm sorry, a, a, just a plus, not a carbocation on the nitrogen. And then we've got the chlorine, right? The chlorine's gonna leave. This is gonna come back down. And then the amide is going to be a protonated amide. Sorry if you guys hear any background noise. The lawnmowers are going outside like crazy. All right, so this is a protonated amide, and then the other amine group is going to come in to grab this, and then I end up with the amide, right, NH2. So there you go. That's our first set of reactions. We learned how to turn a carboxylic acid into an acid chloride. We then learned the reverse of that, how to take an acid chloride back to a carboxylic acid. And then we learned how to turn the acid chloride into the other derivatives, including anhydrides, esters, and amides. So you've got all of those potential reactions that you can work with now. Hopefully everybody found this to be a useful lecture portionality for acid chloride reactivity. Again, I will be releasing a part two. That'll start talking about reduction and Grignard reagents uh, and a couple other techniques like that where your acid chloride is going to undergo a double reaction. And we'll show you exactly what that means next time. So please remember to like the video if you found it helpful. I'm happy to take any comments and if you enjoy the videos and you're going through a course right now, please subscribe to the channel. It helps to support making content like this. And I'm also going to be releasing a video soon. I have courses that I'm rapidly putting out on the platform Udemy. So I'm trying to promote that. That's a great way that you can support the channel. The courses are very affordable. They're less than what would normally be about an hour of tutoring. It will have all the content for a given chapter you need directly taught by me. You'll have access to me so that you can ask me direct questions. You can send questions, scan them, and I can, you know, take a look at them. And I also have PDF notes that go along with those courses directly created by me. So hopefully if you support the channel, if you'd like to take a look at that, um, I'll be having a video coming up very shortly that's going to make an announcement about that. So it's very exciting that we're starting to expand because we're almost approaching a thousand subscribers and you guys have been great in terms of all the support you've shown me throughout the years. So thanks a lot and I will see you guys for the continued lectures.